panic disorder are often uh, calling doctors. They first usually go to um, uh, physicians in emergency rooms before they're going to mental health professionals because they feel like they've got uh, a medical condition. Um, same thing, obviously, with, with hypochondriasis. And they both involve a focus on somatic cues. There's a lot of hypervigilance to body sensations, right? Is it happening now? Kind of monitoring what's going on inside their body. And um, misinterpretation of these somatic symptoms or somatic cues. When there's a pain, that means that there's something terribly wrong. And I think the difference between hypochondriasis and panic is that in panic, the person interprets it as an immediate threat. I am dying, I'm having a heart attack, I better go to the emergency room right now or it's all over. In hypochondriasis, the person usually interprets it as some sort of a, a, a growing, a nagging, or a prolonged condition. I'm developing cancer. I have this disease that no physician can figure out. And if I don't do anything about it now, then soon it's going to get me and I'm going to be incapacitated. So there's a misinterpretation of uh, physical sensations and symptoms, but they're, they, they're somewhat different in terms of the, you know, what, what they're misinterpreting it as. And hypochondriasis also seems to overlap with OCD. Um, both problems involve recurrent, unwanted, fear-provoking thoughts and doubts. And people have likened the um, concerns about illness because of their intrusive and anxiety-provoking nature. They've likened those kinds of thoughts to obsessions in, in OCD, and I, I, I would agree with that. And similarly, the repetitive checking behaviors um, do serve to reduce distress, at least temporarily, which is what rituals do as well. Uh, so I, I do think that those repetitive behaviors are akin to uh, compulsive rituals. They are performed in response to some sort of a, a feared consequence. Hypochondriasis and OCD also involve um, a, a sense of an intolerance of uncertainty. I have to know for sure that the bad consequence isn't going to happen. And that's what checking behavior is all about. People like Jack Rackman have written extensively on uh, models of understanding checking behavior. And what it often boils down to is this need for certainty. Even a, even a small probability isn't enough. I have to know for sure that I don't have that illness. I have to know for sure that I didn't hit that pedestrian. So I got to go back and check. And this is some data from a study that I published with Brett Deacon a couple of years ago showing an elevated um, uh, intolerance of uncertainty, a score, an elevated score on the intolerance of uncertainty scale in people who have <clears throat> OCD and hypochondriasis relative to people who have panic disorder. So again, the somatoform disorder is showing a very similar um, process, psychological process, as what's going on uh, in an anxiety disorder like OCD. What about body vigilance? We talked about that with respect to panic uh, a little while ago. And we can see that in, <clears throat> excuse me, across the anxiety disorders, and if you include hypochondriasis among them, it's right up there when it comes to body vigilance. No significant difference between hypochondriasis and panic disorder or generalized anxiety disorder uh, when it comes to uh, body vigilance. And here we compared, again, a, a different study, well, going back to the Deacon and Abramowitz study, uh, here we compared groups with hypochondriasis, panic disorder, and OCD on a number of these different um, measures. Again, this is the body vigilance scale. <clears throat> Excuse me. And again, no difference between uh, hypochondriasis and, and panic. And the OCD uh, group was significantly lower than the panic folks, but actually not significantly different from the hypochondriasis group. The ASI is the Anxiety Sensitivity Index. Remember, anxiety sensitivity is this tendency to be afraid of internal sensations that are associated with um, uh, autonomic arousal, right? anxious arousal. So a fear of respiratory symptoms, like difficulty catching your breath. Here, uh, the panic disorder folks were significantly higher than folks with hypochondriasis, but they were very similar to the people with, with OCD. And then here, this is focusing on uh, fears of cardiac-related symptoms. When I notice my heart's beating rapidly, right? When, when my, heart has, my heart rate has sped up. And it's the people with hypochondriasis that actually have the highest score relative to even panic disorder. And we know that among the anxiety disorders, panic disorder is something that's you know, uh, very strongly associated with fears of cardiovascular uh, symptoms. So I think here, good evidence that even if, if at the symptom level, there might be some distinctions between hypochondriasis and, and the anxiety disorders, panic and OCD, and certainly the focus exclusively on body sensations has caused panic to be classified as a somatoform disorder uh, rather than um, an anxiety disorder, 
in terms of the psychological processes and the function of the behavior that we observe in these, in these uh, conditions, there are lots of overlaps. The anxiety-provoking thoughts and anxiety-reducing behaviors are common uh, to uh, all three conditions, primarily OCD and, um, and, and hypochondriasis. And the, we see intolerance of uncertainty in these different problems. We see body vigilance. We see a fear of cardiovascular disease-related uh, uh, somatic symptoms. So again, I think it's important to consider hypochondriasis rather than just the fact that it's focusing on body sensations, and so that makes it different in some way. It should be a somatoform disorder. I think we should look at it at, at the functional level, at the, the process level, rather than the, the superficial level. So is hypochondriasis an anxiety disorder? I think that the research absolutely supports uh, the fact that it is. However, um, in the new DSM, we're not going to see, it looks as of now, we're not going to see hypochondriasis being moved into, into the anxiety disorders. And that's because what we are going to see, probably, is a new somatoform disorder that is going to merge somatization disorder, undifferentiated somatoform disorder, pain disorders, and hypochondriasis. And it's, my, at this point, it's proposed to be called complex somatic symptom disorder. Try to say that 10 times fast <coughs> in Swedish. <laughs> And here are the diagnostic criteria for what that's going to look like. So you have to have multiple somatic symptoms that are distressing or one severe symptom. Um, you got to have misattributions or excessive concern or preoccupation with the symptoms and the illness, which sounds to me a lot like health anxiety, actually. Um, and at least two of the following are required. One, high level of health-related anxiety. OK, it's, it's health anxiety. They're even admitting it. Normal body sy symptoms are viewed as threatening or harmful. That's health anxiety. A tendency to assume the worst about health or catastrophizing, <laughs> that's anxiety, it's a definition of anxiety disorders, and belief that the, the seriousness of the symptoms um, persist despite evidence to the, to the contrary, and the health concerns have to assume a central role in the person's lives, and it has to be uh, going on for at least six months. So again, why not have this be, this sounds like an anxiety disorder, health anxiety disorder, uh, rather than being a somatoform disorder. I fear that this leads us away from uh, the best uh, treatments that are available uh, for these kinds of problems, which are other treatments for anxiety disorders. Serotonin reuptake inhibitors work for uh, hypochondriasis, cognitive behavior therapy. It's very similar to what we do for OCD and panic, or is also as effective as the uh, medications for um, hypochondriasis. So to kind of sum up, um, I, you know, maybe we've, we've come a long way from uh, Linnaeus, as you mentioned in your, your introduction, but I still think we actually have a little ways to go. Um, some of the research that, that I've presented and the other research that's out there supports uh, some of the changes that are um, proposed here for the DSM-5 with respect to anxiety disorders. I think some of the proposed changes are not supported by that, that research. Um, and, and I think that the DSM development process is a very complex one, and maybe you'll get some insight into that when uh, Kathy Phillips comes in the fall. It should be a very interesting uh, talk that she gives. Um, I, I, I hope that there's a, a role for science. It's not always clear exactly what that is. Um, I also, as a, a little bit of a, a, a skeptic sometimes, feel like there's um, a, an emphasis on some of the social and political and financial interests that are involved uh, with the DSM-5. Um, but one of the things that is very clear is that the emphasis seems to be on the form rather than on the function, rather than on the, the psychological, the, the phenomenological processes that are going on uh, in these conditions. Um, but I will say that the process is ongoing, and um, changes to the current proposals that, that I've kind of just outlined here uh, may still occur. And you can actually uh, keep track of what's going on. There's a nifty website that's been set up, www.dsm5.org. Actually, is anyone familiar with that? A few of you, okay. Um, you, can, you can actually read about uh, what's going on. And there was a time when you could actually write in and contribute and, and you know, make some suggestions. Uh, and I think that time, that period has ended. Uh, I think now they're considering the suggestions. And I guess we'll, we'll see what happens in the next few years. I thank you very much.